The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Oh, we have Russell Edwards, um, author of Naming Jack the Ripper, and I'm glad you can join us tonight. Thank you very much, Al. It's a pleasure. So how have you been doing? It sounds like you've been real busy. Yeah, it's, it's two months now since the release of the book, and, you know, we've not slowed at all. The momentum's still there. Um, <laughs> it just just the, the phenomenal response we've had for, from the world, really, you know, it's been extremely positive. Uh, we're very happy, of course. Yeah, I mean, that's a good thing. I mean, you must feel good that you've kind of solved something and uh, and, uh, and uh, you weren't sure that you were going to do it, you know, and it just sort of happened. That's that's great, eh? Yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, I, mean, I must admit, three and a half years um, traipse it was. Well, they traipse. Um, that's an English word for just schlepping up to the northwest, about two hundred and fifty miles every week to see. Uh, Dr. Yari Lokalainen in his lab, working with him for three and a half years to make sure we've absolutely nailed every single angle we could, you know, not knowing if we were going to get the, the real results, you know, or not. And then when, when we did get the results, it was just truly phenomenal. The response has been overwhelming. Well, that's good. That's good. So now for the people that haven't, um, who don't know you, let's start out with um, who you are and... Uh and uh, what you what you sort of have done with your life b- before this, like so, what? Uh, who are you, and where where do you come from, and what do you kind of do? Sure. Well, I'm Russell Edwards. Um, I was born in the Northwest. Um, my accent is not far from Liverpool, um, so obviously everybody thinks that I'm from the same place as the Beatles. You know, which we truly love. We truly love our city. Um, we were, you know, in the 60s, they had the Mersey beat, so very much influenced the musician um, that I used to be in my former years. Um, yes, uh, really a businessman. Uh, property is my passion, architecture. Um, that's really where I started. Um, came down south to Cambridge about 25 years ago, um, then got a place at a college in London, and that's really where the introduction to the City of London started for me back in 89. Um, then I got introduced to the East End of London, and of course, it's just just an overwhelmingly brilliant place to be, in my opinion, and so many other people's opinions. You know, but you sort of get hooked into just the whole culture of that place. It's sort of like a, I would say, a street level cool, if that if that's you know if you can understand that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's really you know obviously I'm a very happily married man, and I've got two beautiful children. Um, who I adore, who are just very proud of the dad of what he's just done. Um, yeah, and I, I just um, got interested in this story about 14 years ago, uh, really because it's so linked within, within I would say, 100 yards of where I've been for 11 years uh, with, through my various businesses that I've done. And that, that's really a little bit about me in a nutshell, if you like. Yeah, so that was um, architecture, so that, that's... A good place to be, London, eh? <laughs> oh, it is. I mean, you know, I'm constantly doing stuff on Twitter and Facebook of just how beautiful the architecture of this city is. I mean, I was in Stonehenge yesterday doing the same thing. But, you know, we've got some wonderful cities, of course, America, you know, same over there. It's, it's just like this eye for, for beauty and buildings. It's, you know, people actually really cared about what they presented on this, you know, all those years ago. And again, Paris is another one of my favourites. This is just the city of love, and anybody that can ever get the chance or take time to go there, it's just overwhelming with beauty. It's just, you know, it's fabulous. Of course, autumn with the turning of the colour of the trees, you get this lovely colour. It's just, just fantastic. Yeah, they're both lovely cities. I've been to both. They're great. I think that, uh, yeah. you know. Uh, do you have a favourite building or something that you just love? Above all, oh, um, again, it's it's a bit like saying what's your favourite film. You know, you, it depends what mood you're in. Um, I've just been up buying today, taking photos of the stock exchange and all the different architecture that's loomed over now by the new buildings, all these glass skyscrapers that seem to be just sprouting up in the city. 
Um, of course, you've got Big Ben, which whenever anybody sees Big Ben in real life, the first thing they say is actually quite little. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's just everything, really. It, it, there's just too many splendid places to sort of name one, you know. Yeah, I know. It's it's amazing. I just... Yeah. So, so now, let's start with um, what brought you into Jack the Ripper? Yeah, well, as I said, I, I came down to London really in at, at the autumn of eighteen eighty. Sorry, autumn of nineteen eighty nine. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tell you, what, I do feel it today. I tell you, um, <laughs> and really, um, it was going down the bagel shops, which is like this twenty four hour bagel bake at the north end of Brick Lane, which is in the East End. Um, again, just passionately fell in love with the area, with all the colours, the smells of the curry houses. Um, and that sort of it was like a, if you like, a spiritual home for me. And I used to take, when we did set up our businesses, we used to take all our corporate clients down there because it's so, so colourful, you know, with all the, the bright lights and just the different cultures down there. And then uh, I watched this film from hell with Johnny Depp. Um, I mean, obviously, so many tremendous actors were in that film, but most people identify with uh, Johnny Depp. Um, and then I wondered where, you know, where did he kill all these people? Was it a myth? Is he like Dracula or Frankenstein? And then lo and behold, I realized, no, there was a serial killer. He did murder these women, and these were real people. And I realized, at, well, on, at that point, I realized, you know, this is a true unsolved mystery. And that's really where, the, where it started, you know? Yeah. So that was... so. Now, how long did it take you to get through? Like, uh, it seems, seems like it took you a number of years to get this book together. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, well, we go back, the love of the East End for me is now 25 years. I've been interested in this story. For the first six years, it wasn't like a, a morbid obsession at all. I just like a passing interest and just thought I'd have a little go and see if any, you know, play Hunt the Ripper like so many people do and have done over, what is it now, over a, a 126 years. And then when I managed to buy the shawl, um, which I'm sure we'll come on to, that's really when the true story started. So in, in answer to your question, it's been about 14 years, 14 and a half years now. Wow. That's a lot of time. Oh, yeah. So now you um, started researching. What, what was what was the first thing that you, uh, you were doing? Like you were going to the areas, you were searching out. And uh, yeah. how, so let's actually let's tell people about what, what was it like back then? So the the crime scene itself back then police how did they handle the crime scene okay so if we go back to victorian london if you, if you can imagine we're going back um to 1888 there was no sophistication like there is in modern day um police work so um a, a murder victim would be discovered um she'd be taken to the mortuary invariably all the evidence would be destroyed and burnt because of course there was no DNA, no forensics, fingerprint testing in very, very early days. So really the crime scenes were washed down with buckets of water and everyone got on with the daily life. And back then, unless you got an identification or a confession, you were never going to get um, a conviction. Wow. So it made it quite a bit tougher. Um, yeah. So... How many how many murders were for the people that don't know, which is um, probably hard to believe, but I guess there are. How many murders did uh, Jack the Ripper get associated with? Yeah, well, over a two year period at that time, there were eleven murders, five of which were attributed to the myth of Jack the Ripper because of the M.O. the, the way he actually conducted the murders. Yeah. So now, were they? Uh, who were these people that were murdered? Were they? Uh, uh, average citizens, were they workers, or uh, yeah, what were yeah, they? The, well, well, these poor ladies were, you know, lots of people just call them prostitutes, but really they're called unfortunates. And these are uh, women that had fallen from grace, if you like, they had regular lives, something happened to them at some point in their lives, and they fell on very hard times, became, um, you know, heavy drinkers, alcoholics. If you, I'd say alcoholics. That's too strong a word. They, they more dependent on just getting through a very harsh life, living a day-to-day, -day, daily existence, trying to get some money whichever way they could, you know. And at the end, if they, you know, if they weren't selling flowers or thimbles or matches, a bit like Eliza Doolittle back in My Fair Lady, then they would have 
to sell the bodies for, you know, four pence to pay for the room for the evening. But they really did live a daily existence. And back then there was about 1,200 of them in the Whitechapel area. Wow, so it was pretty common. It wasn't... Uh... Yeah, yeah. So what was the mentality? Did you, did you, did you, I guess they weren't treated very well in, in common society. Absolutely not. At the time, you know, the, at the end of the, the 19th century, um, it was, you know, England had the Commonwealth, uh, Victorian Britain, Queen Victoria, um, they say Britain ruled the waves, and it, there was one part, little part of London where really it was the, the vice then, if you like, which was Whitechapel, very violent, um, there was these things called high rip guys, which are these guys that used to go and bully these uh, poor women and just take whatever farthings, coppers, whatever they had on them. Um, you, you know, it was just a very, very grueling, hard existence. And then just on to, to sort of compound this, um, it was such a, well, Whitechapel such a, a city, um, an area of flux. So, um, of course, uh, the po uh, Poland was under Russian rule at the time. And the poor people of Poland had to flee their own country. So families would just give up their whole lives just to start again because it was so terrible for them. So there was only two places to go, really, which was Whitechapel or New York. So and that was that was it. So you had a, a huge influx of people looking for a new home. And um, it was they set up their homes in Whitechapel. So you had this whole uh, anti, a whole huge amount of anti-Semitism going on at the same time as well. Right. So, so they weren't treated very well, very well, I guess. In your, if you're living in that area in the Whitechapel, and your people didn't treat them very well. So, the, I, I'm trying to get to. So, I guess the cops didn't really care that they were being killed, or did they? Oh, of course they did. Yes, this was. I mean, this is exceptionally uncommon. You know, it was one thing, the huge amount of um, work they had to do just on, just keep it, just keeping it at bay, if you like, uh, Whitechapel at bay. Um, but really, yes, they took this very, very seriously, the police at the time. Remembering, we're, we're looking at 1888, and the police force was set up by Sir Robert Peel only in 1829. So, you know, even though it was still there, it was sort of still in its infancy of learning the procedures and the um, and the strict rules of what they had to adhere to, you know. But yes, they did take this exceptionally seriously at the time. What do you What do you think the big um, curiosity is about this? I mean, so long now, and people still talk about it, and it's still they can still make movies about it, and uh, people are still very involved. Um, is there something particular about this case? I think it, I think it captures all the romance of what what people imagine of the Victorian era. I mean, even if you look at uh, pictures of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, Oscar Wilde got the inspiration for that story by visiting the opium dens down in Whitechapel himself. You know, so it's this history, you've got this old, you know, this Victorian era, then you've got this uh, mythical character, Jack the Ripper, so you, you know, people, a lot of people identify that this is just this fantasy, you know, this, this, this specter, if you like, that's not really existent, like I did when I first started. But then when you realise there was a serial killer brutalising these women in a most terrible way, you know, which is what sparked it for me, was, you know, surely somebody should be bring, bringing this guy to justice. Um, but no, it, it, that's this thing. It's this unsolved mystery. It's who done it. You know, I've always said it is a who done it of who done it. You know, no one's been able, able to actually finally, you know, point a finger at this guy until I came along and had something forensic to... To once, you know, for once and for all, put the story to bed, if you like. Yeah. Now, so, so you've been there and uh, been in the area. Can can you still feel it? Can you still feel oh, all that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The, yeah. You really can, especially in the evenings, when you know, when the, when the twilight falls and you get in the dark start, starts blooming in. The, it has this amazing sensational feeling. It, it's very hard to describe. But what I can tell you, there's, four, there's only about four streets left with these amazing Georgian buildings that were built about 1729, and you have this chill. Even in the summer, there's this chill when you walk around it with the old street lights. Very amazing place to be, you know. But yeah, there is some, something there, yeah. Do you, so, I mean, we'll, we'll just go off a little. Do you, do you believe in the afterlife or ghost, or do you think any of that's existing there? 
I don't know if it's there. I mean, you know, I'm very open to um, more than what we know. Let's just put that way. Um, yeah, I, I went to visit a place called Borley Rectory only the, uh, last week, which is meant to be the most haunted, has the most haunted house in Britain. Just these, this imagined ethereal plane that, that obviously exists uh, to those that believe us should imagine. You know, I think there's more, there's more out there, I think. But, you know, who am I really to say there is or there isn't? But, yeah, you know. well, I mean, I mean, you can, it's how, it's what we feel. I mean, that's what it is. Yeah. I think, um, so do you think there's some residual effect there? Do you, like, feel the terror or feel the... Well, what, not, not the terror so much. I mean, it, again, if you ever visit these lovely churches in and around the area, it has, again, that spiritual feeling because it sort of encapsulates so many, you know, generations of hundreds of thousands, of, I say hundreds of thousands, hundreds and thousands of years of people going to share their, you know, their praying. And it captures, it just has this spirit and Whitechapel does have this spirit, this this buzz, this um, this just this draw, if you like, to people that come and visit it without actually realising. And once they get there, they you know most people walk away thinking, "Wow, yeah, I've seen why an experienced Whitechapel." Okay, so now let's get into the uh, actual killings. So, um, do you think that all the killings were done by the same person then? Of the five, yes, um, I do. It, very sim. I mean, you know, again, they're called the canonical five. The M.O. The way he murdered them is the same. Um, far better ripperologist than I. You know, it, it, it's very clear that he's these are very vicious. They escalated with violence. I mean, we're only one day. Yesterday was the date of the, the anniversary of the very last murder of the Ripper, which was that of Mary Jane Kelly. You know, it, he he, he's, he murdered these poor women in a very specific way. The violence towards them escalated. It was only a 10-week period. So, yeah, five of these 11 Whitechapel murders, yeah, were definitely down to him. So uh, what, what was the specific way that he killed them that was, that was unique to him? Yeah, I mean, really, the, the, the way that I, I, I not always explain it is that, so just, just excuse me a second. Um, so, uh, what it is is um, he used to throttle them or strangle them. He then used to cut the throat. He then used to mutilate them. He would disembowel them. He would take the uterus. On the fourth murder victim, he also took a uterus and her kidney. On the fifth victim, he stole a heart. Um, a very vicious, vicious, violent serial killer. Do, do we know what he did with the body parts or the things that he took? Well, again, you know, this is down to speculation. Um, I ask, what, why would you take a woman's uterus? What, what would be the significance of that? And again... I've tried to avoid in my book uh, any speculation or theory, but why would you? It, it's a very unco why take a body part? Why are these trophies? You know, you know, most serial killers keep trophies of the victims, but in this case, it was they were body parts, and I mean, did did, I, they, did they ever find any of these pieces? Um, well, thank you for asking that. Well, on the sixteenth of October in eighteen eighty eight. There was this gentleman called George Lusk, who was the head of what they call a vigilance committee, which is like these guys that, that all shopkeepers that all banded together to try and go out to patrol the streets to protect these unfortunate women. Now, George Luck, Lusk, he got a letter, and it was entitled From Hell, and that's the only rip letter that wasn't signed Jack the Ripper. And he also got half a kidney that was supposed to be taken by Catherine Eddowes. Um, so, yes, he actually... He says in the letter that he ate half of it, and then he posted the other half to this man called George Lusk. So that's the only, you know, the only body part from the Ripper himself that was ever, you know, ever presented back to, to the world, really. Wow. That's amazing. So now you have, have uh, what was the first break for you in the case? 
Yeah, well, that was actually going back to 2007 in the March when a shawl came up for sale at auction that was purported to be taken from the body of the fourth murder victim, Catherine Eddowes. And again, you know, it was a case of, well, what a massive claim, to, but with no scientific anal uh, real analysis done on it. And I thought, well, if there, if there was something tangible and this was it, this would be the only piece of remaining evidence to this enigmatic mystery um, to the legend of Jack the Ripper. And that's really where this, this, um, this story where we are today starts. Um, of course, when I bought it, I'm not a scientist or a researcher. I certainly wasn't back then. I had a passive interest or a passing interest in the story. And I thought, you know what, if I could you know, one day prove the identity of this murderer through this, or at the time, just proof that this came from the case, I thought that would be a phenomenal finding. Of course, little did I know, seven and a half years later, here we are with the actual conclusive proof who Jack the Ripper was. Yeah, that's me. Okay, on that note, let's just take another break, and we'll be back after this commercial. Um, so now you went and you got this shawl, and how did you start, like, how did you process the evidence? Like, so did you, who did you take it to to get it, uh, you know, yeah. analyzed? Well, well, to be honest, it, it, again, you, everybody thinks with things like CSI, you can just take a piece of an, um, evidence and prove it in minutes. It doesn't work like that. No. <laughs> I didn't know where to start. It's remembering that it's old DNA, so it's not fresh, so I needed to find an ancient DNA specialist. I then got told that and find uh, a descendant down the female line of one of these murder victims to match. It's one thing getting DNA off the shore, but then another thing to actually match it with anybody. And all of these things back then were very, very huge things for someone like me to do. And it took me nearly th over three and a half years to find the right guy who was prepared to cooperate with me to, to you know, to basically undergo this voyage that I've been on. I think one of the most, um, for me, that the day, or one of the days for me, was when I took it to him in his lab, let him um, scientifically work on it for the day, and he came back to me and said, look, all of this here, all these spots on this shore, which you can see with the naked eye, is arterial blood spatter in the form of slashing. So someone's had their throat cut and the arterial spray from that is all over this shore and this is where it all is. And this clot that's on the shore, that looks like it's um, from a body, you know, that it's a, it's a, a body part. And um, there's other bodily fluids on there. And I was like, wow, this could be it. And that's really where I got hooked. So what did you do next? So how how could you um, tie that to the murder? Exactly. So the thing is, it was um, if this had come from the fourth murder scene uh, um, of the Ripper, it had to be placed there. And the only way to do that to see if that the blood uh, matched the descendants of Catherine Eddowes. So then I had to find a, a, a great 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 granddaughter who had come from down the female line, so that means Catherine Eddowes' daughter had to, you know, have a daughter, had to have a daughter, had to have a daughter, and that's the only way you could get a match, and that was really daunting, that took me a couple of years to find that. Um, once, and, and again, not just that, I had to um, talk to this lady, her name's Karen Miller, who's been extremely supportive and exceptionally generous to me, um, and she gave me a DNA sample. And after a year's worth of intensive analysis, uh, Dr. Yori Lohalainen, in his the techniques that he used, uh, managed to, to get that match. Now, of course, we had to avoid contamination issues, so it wasn't a, a surface sample. It was actually taken from the weave in the fabric because the blood had embedded in there. Um, and then again, thinking it was Catherine Eddowes' shawl and not anybody else's, we then had to date the shawl. And to date the shawl, so that, to make sure that it was in existence before or at the time of the murders, again, it was a huge, massive piece of work. So I went to the experts, the, what we call in England the V&A Museum, Victoria and Albert Museum, the specialists there, Sotheby's uh, and Christie's, who have specialists in their own rights. Um, I went to a place called the Huguenot Society, and they represent the French silk weavers that used to live in Spitalfields and Whitechapel before... Uh, the murders, you know, back in the 17th century and the 18th century. 
Um, they, all of these people helped me along my way. And then a silk expert in Switzerland. So I really did, you know, really did embark on this massive odyssey, if you like, to get to the answer of this. And then when, I real, when they, all these guys, they did predate it, they, more or less 1815 to 1835, we then took it to a scientist. Uh, who used mass spectrometry. We then identified the dye to come from northern Russia. And the five experts, they said, well, actually, you know what? It's not British. Then all of a sudden I realised he took it with him. The murderer took it with him to the murder site. It wasn't Catherine Eddowes uh, shawl at all. So then that really raised the bar because then whatever body parts, we, uh, sorry, whatever bodily fluids we could find on there that weren't Catherine Eddowes could have come from the murderer. So then we were gripped and we found semen on semen on the shore, and then that was the you know the, the the massive thing for us because what we've got now, we know that the murderer took this for a specific reason on that night when he murdered two women inside 40, 45 minutes. He left his his own bodily fluids on there, and this this big sort of spine chilling revelation that if we could match that with a descendant, then we've got the identity of Jack the Ripper. And that was where we were about a year ago. Then trying, obviously, uh, well, not obviously, but the thing is, uh, Aaron Kosminski had not had any children. He was mentally ill. Um, so we had to um, get the DNA from his sister and find again, down the female line, a descendant who would cooperate and give us a DNA sample, which he did, thankfully, and then underwent, I think it was about a 10-month really, really intensive um, set of scientific analysis all through the genius of Dr. Yari Lohalainen. And then in February, sort of, you know, you can imagine that tense nail-biting set of months where you don't get any sleep. And then one night he said, we've got a match. And that was just, yeah, that was... That must have been pretty the exciting at the time. Well... At the time we were on, you know, we, this was top secret, as you can imagine. And only four people in the world knew we were doing this outside Yari and I. And it was half eight on a Friday night. And I couldn't get hold of anyone to share this with. And it was one of these things, it was just seven and a half years of intensive, you know, really racking your brain and everything you've got of your person, you know, your, it's the challenges. And then all of a sudden it's been vindicated. We've proven it. We've got the identity of Jack the Ripper. And then when you want to tell the world, you just can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, hard in the day of communication, too. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You know, yeah, one of, one of the most amazing experiences, I promise you, Al. It was, it's been amazing. I bet. So, now, the murderer, um, what can you tell us about him? Yeah. Okay, well, the thing is, it was one thing, there's about 120, 130 suspects. So all, so it, we'll start. Well, when I bought the shawl, I knew it had been, ha been held in Scotland Yard's Crime Museum. So I contacted them. And thankfully, the curator at the time, a, a gentleman by the name of Alan McCormack, said there was a main suspect. He had been identified, but couldn't have been prosecuted because of uh, J uh, Jewish religion because he was Jewish and the, ident and the witness was Jewish. So it was against their religion to, and um, for the eyewitness to testify, which is I, I just recently found out um, that. But he, uh, his name, Israel Swartz, the, um, the man that identified Aaron Kosminski, attacking the third murder victim minutes before she was found murdered. Um, Scotland Yard, um, they told me that um, because of that, they couldn't arrest him. So they always had their main suspect. And he was, Kuzminski was named by the head of the investigation not long after the murders. So I had my main man, the, the suspect, the person to follow. So Aaron Kuzminski was a Polish Jewish immigrant that came over with his family um, in 1881. So he'd had seven years to learn the area. He was 23 at the time of the murders. Um, he was in, incarcerated in Coney Hatch Asylum in February 19, 1891, um, he stayed there for a few years and then was moved to Lewiston Asylum and died aged 53, 54 in uh, 1919. Wow. So 
how did you tie him to the shawl? Well, thank you for asking. This is it, you see. Um, Yari, in his, um, in his, let me just say, scientific exploration of this, a garment that we own, um, he um, managed to identify semen on the shore. Then we had to make sure that this, if there was any cells in there, because we're talking, again, fragmented DNA, we're talking ancient DNA. Um, Yori did tell me, you know, you can go back 10,000 years and get DNA. So he said this, you know, it presents a challenge, but not one that's impossible. So he managed to get um, uncontaminated cells from various semen stains and gave it to a colleague of his who was um, what we call a sperm head analysis. And there's only three of those guys in the country. Three months after, he managed to isolate cells from those uh, sperm heads. And from those cells, we managed to get DNA, a DNA profile. From that DNA profile, we had to find a descendant for his Kuzminski's sister, Matilda. And we did. And the DNA, um, again, this is sort of a, a six-month, eight-month set of really intensive analysis. And it took us that long to actually get the match. But we got a match that was 100%. Wow. So... Now you've, you've tied it. So who did you, you know, tell us about Yari. Uh, Dr. Yari Lohalainen, yes, he's a, a Finnish gentleman. Uh, he's uh, been in the world of forensics for 30 years, has a vast amount of knowledge. Um, he does work with Interpol. Um, he, he heads up quite a lot of very fascinating subjects. So he's working on something to do with the Mary Rose, again, going back to Henry VIII's time. Um, he had, he's one of the consultants on a huge Roman dig um, in a place called Chester, which is in the northwest of England, not far from where I am, where they've just found a burial gown with 1,500 Roman soldiers, which he's in uh, one of the main consultants on as well. He's um, an associate professor in Helsinki. Um, molecular biology and forensics is his, his passion, his love. Um, again, a married man uh, with two beautiful daughters. And they've uh, been one of the most amazing allies, and now we've got our friendships just, just blossomed, as you can imagine, over the last few years. Um, yes, uh, again, a, a very highly intellectual man that's been so understanding of me, a non-scientist. So when Yari explains some of the scientific work to me, he has to do it in layman's terms. And one of the funny things we always say is he explains something to me, I explain it back, thinking I've understood it, and he says, no, that's not it, but if that works for you, keep it like that. So it's just this one of these things, that, <laughs> uh, just, just trying to, you know, different heads, if you like, and how we can sort of communicate and understand each other. Yeah. yeah. yeah An totally amazing, different. amazingly gifted scientist. Where, where did you find him? Yeah, well, we, we'd, um, just out of the blue, I was asked to take part in a documentary a few years ago, and, um, yeah, that's where we, and so did Yari, and that's where we met. We, we met together. Uh, he was going to do some scientific work. Again, that's where it really, where we, where we were really very happy to uh, do the real work and not something just for TV, which was just superficial. Um, and, it, you know, he had about 15 minutes to do the TV work, um, really just, just for broadcast. And then I didn't understand back then it would take so long, which is again three and a half years, to do you know a case and amount of work, something like this. Yeah, it's pretty pretty amazing. What 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 was the mental state? Do you think of of uh, um, the killer? Yeah, well, when he was incarcerated in Coney Hatch Asylum, um, they, they gave him the title of mania. His profession also was barber. And we know back to, back then in Victorian London, uh, Barber also was a surgeon. So it's the surgical knowledge is seen. But the fact of mania, there was only that schizophrenia um, hadn't been given a title back then. So really, we're looking at a man who was paranoid schizophrenic, who had delusionary states, who had voices, uh, would only eat bread from the gutter. Um, yeah, I would, I would go for paranoid schizophrenia. Did you come up with a kind of a cause of why he was killing all these these women? Yeah, this is, okay. So we look, we go back a bit further. If we, there's a amazing work being done with um, 
on this this woeful affliction of schizophrenia over the years. Um, a gentleman by the name of R.D. Lyne looked at schizophrenia in the family. And it, in a lot of cases, they're the precursor to symptoms of schizophrenia. We look back at uh, Kosminski's life, and we know his father died at the age of eight. Uh, so there's lack of attachment, so there's only the mother figure. We know that his mum was 45 when she gave birth to Kosminski. And if you look at four of the five victims, that was about the age of the victims. So what, this is, again, this is a lot of work. There's still a lot of work to be done. But we look at sort of is there a bitter hatred of women through his mother because he was known as a misogynist, uh, Kosminski. And we know that misogyny, a, a misogynist is somebody that has a bitter hatred of women. So you put all these factors into the mix uh, and, you know, you've got a, you've got a suspect. But then again, without the scientific work through the DNA, you would only have a suspect and you wouldn't have uh, somebody who you convict, who you could convict. So you can see all of these things fit the puzzle of Kosminski. And then, of course, the DNA matches sort of the, the icing on the cake, if you like. So what is it that you think that ties the shawl to him? Well, this is it, you see. It came from Russia. Um, I looked at Pavlovsky Posad, who were making shawls back then. Um, he obviously, the, the, the pattern on the shawl was on, significant of three of the five murder dates. And he obviously took that with him to make that point, the point of Michaelmas, which is the Michaelmas Daisy pattern on the shore, which goes back to newspaper records uh, of, of the time, that Michaelmas is celebrated by uh, the Christians and Orthodox Christians on the 29th of September, when he went out uh, on the night of the 29th to look for a victim. He ended up murdering two. And the 8th of November, he left the shore there to let the, to, in a very obscure way, which is I'm the only person who seems to have linked this, and Scotland Yard thanked me on that, that the 8th of, September, 8th of November is the other date of Michaelmas, and he went out on the 8th to find a murder victim, and Mary Jane Kelly was found on the 9th, which happens to be 126 years ago yesterday. So it's a very cryptic um, clue, a message, and he let the police and the world know the, ne the date of the next murder, and it was. And for many, many years, in fact, 126 years, no one could understand why he murdered four women inside four weeks and then stopped and didn't murder one for a further five weeks. So this shawl was such a significant find just in that. But of course, we also look at the fact that semen on the shore, and because he used to take the uteri of these women, you know, was it just a sadistic murderer? Well, actually, now we know semen was on there, we know it was his, that it also changes the, the you know, the motive. It was sexually driven. So the, the, all these points are, you know, it's this revelation of all these things that have come out just from the shawl. And I guess the shawl could have, couldn't have been the victim. Well, this is it. Um, there's two types of dye on there, um, and the rudimentary plant dyes, which predates 1856 through the science. Um, if the shawl was taken outside um, in the rain, the, the dye would have washed out. We're extremely lucky that shore's never been washed because all the dye would have just run out. Uh, one of, this, one of the, uh, Dr. Fires Ismail that did all this, um, the dye analysis for us said this shore could only have been owned by uh, someone of a middle class background or middle class family. And we know that Kosminski's family were, were quite very well re revered and respected successful tailors in uh, Whitechapel at the time of the murders. Wow. So, overall, how's how's the response been to your to to your book? Um, exceptionally well. Uh, there are those people that try and keep this a myth. There'll always be the non-believers. We've always said, if Jack the Ripper was alive today, handing one of these non-believers the bloody knife and said, "I'm Jack the Ripper," they would still say, "I don't believe you." And there will always be these type of people. But on the whole. We've had such a tremendous uh, response, you know, to the fact that we've we've solved this mystery. Yeah, that's that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, where where do you see yourself going now after this? Well, there's um, two two more unsolved murders that Yari and I. I mean, you can imagine this this journey of, of um, discovery that we've gone on. It's quite hard to, to not to leave it. We, we'd like to go and do another unsolved mystery, to be honest. Wow. 
Uh, can you tell us what you're looking at now? Ah, there's two. There's one one in England, uh, ex- uh, not as notorious as Jack the Ripper, but still very big in, in English history. And then there's one in the US which is unsolved, and we'd like to have a have a try of that one, uh, which will be sort of mid next year. Wow, exciting adventure! <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, what what can you tell us about the uh, back to the Jack the Ripper? What, what can you tell us that we're we're not hearing? Um, but, but the Jack the Ripper is this uh, myth um, that that's, uh, was spawned at the time of the murders and just stayed in the public psyche in a global way for over a century and a quarter. But actually, um, as I found out when I was when I watched the film from Hell, this cloaks the fact that there was a serial killer that brutalised women in London at the time, and he was never brought to justice. And it was my endeavour to, um, and that's really what my motive behind all this, my endeavour to see if we could actually prove this conclusively once and for all. And thanks to the brilliance of, and of the scientific genius of Dr. Yari Lohalainen, and my my drive, if you like, to just keep this going until we get to a conclusion, we've managed to finally conclusively prove the identity of that serial killer. And the serial killer, uh, you sort of got this myth, this fan. See, a bit like Dracula and Frankenstein, which is called Jack the Ripper, uh, which really sort of over, overshadows the, this serial killer that we've now named as Aaron Kuzminski. Do you find that there's any um, good movies or any good programs out there that sort of represents what happened? Yeah, well, well, well again, the, the films that have come out all related to the Duke of Clarence, um, which was which is just not true, but the fact that if you imagine that Jack the Ripper could have been the Prince of Queen Victoria, or the, the son of Queen Victoria, you couldn't get a better suspect, if you like, and sort of bring, you know, the prevalence of the case to the fore. But really, you know, it, 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 everybody has their own take on this. Um, but really, if you look at, uh, again, From Hell, it's a great film. But again, it wasn't Sir William Gull, which it, what is portrayed in the film. But it gives a good, strong representation of the violence and what the Ripper did back at the time of the murders. Well, what, what, well so now when they did research on, on that, their, their own DNA and research, what makes yours um, more, let's say, more, more real or makes you think that you're, what you've done is more real than what they've done? Thank you for the question, Al. Well, believe it or not, the only thing in existence is this shawl. All of these suspects are all on theory. There's no other DNA evidence. There is no other forensic testing. There's nothing. This is the only piece of evidence in history that's linked the Ripper to uh, the murderer. You know, the actual, the real murder, if you like. Everything else has been hearsay, and there's been nothing really tangible other than a really fantastic authoress, um, Patricia Cornwell, um, that did um, look at the, uh, analyse the glue on the stamps of the Ripper letters to see if that was a way you could find Jack the Ripper. But even so, um, that only could have if that somebody wrote a letter. Couldn't conclusively prove that whoever wrote that letter was the murderer. So, uh, the, you know, an amazing lady, I'm being told, um, and some of the books are, are just extremely fantastic. Um, she was the first lady that t- to do any forensic work, but only from stamps. And that could only really say that they wrote, you know, the letters were written by whoever, but that's all really. Do you think, what do you think that ties them to someone? Like, why would someone write the letters? Well, you know what? Lots of people wrote um, letters back then um, for, I've no, you know, for, for obscure reasons, which I can't really give you an answer to. But there were hundreds and hundreds of letters written at the time, all saying that they were from Jack the Ripper. But who knows? The only letter really is the From Hell letter, um, which, as I said before, that had half a kidney with it. But that disappeared. You know, nobody really knows if the the one that's just turned up out of the blue all of a sudden is the real one. You know. But yeah. really, again, even so, you could then you'd have to go back to the kidney, which is gone, long gone now. Um, you know, this is the only valid, tangible piece of evidence in history. And I, I should imagine, you know, that that's 
what took me down this journey over seven and a half years and brought me to the, the, the conclusive conclusion, if you like. And there's never been anyone else to, the, to be able to do that in over 126 years. Right. And that um, the, the stamp that they tested with DNA, now was that come out to be a woman or something? Well, this is it. You know, um, I think it was the Openshaw letter, which is believed to be genuine, but it's only believed. And yes, the, the, the stamp again was reanalyzed only three years ago, and it turned out that the DNA on there was female, not male. Yeah, so that's, uh, well, that's yeah. kind of weird in itself, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, it's, it, again, this thing about throwing, you know, to obfuscate the story, really. But even so, if it if it was male and it was um, Patricia Cornwell's uh, suspect, it would only prove he wrote that letter and not actually stood there and did the murders, you see. Yeah. Wow. But yeah. even so, even so, may I just say, the amount of effort uh, to write a book, which I've only written one, um, to do something like this and the conviction for all these amazing authors over the years has still managed to breathe life into this story. Oh yeah, totally. A whole new, a whole new thing. Now, mm. I was going to say also now in the shawl there is blood, blood splatter, and yeah. semen. Now, didn't yeah. it also? Did it also have shapes or something? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's um, clear evidence of split body parts, which is exceptionally hard to, to uh, forge. Which is what Yari told me one January morning several years ago. Yeah, there's a clear clot. There's, a, there's been a body part placed on there. And we know from the fourth murder that he did take Catherine Addo's kidney and her uterus. Yeah, that's weird. Now, <laughs> yeah, it certainly is. <laughs> it yeah. Just, yeah, you know, I, do, you, do you see yourself, do you see it going any further than this now? Is there any other avenues to pursue, do you think, with Jack the Ripper? Of course there is. We, you know, th there should be a lot more work looking into uh, the history of Kuzminski. Uh, mental illness is a, a, is a very big topic. Why he murdered them in this specific way. I mean, they are a very specific ritualistic style of murders, which we know uh, that you, you, that's how you know that they're the same guy, and it's, it, it was Kuzminski. Um, yeah, we, we, we did, you know, about, um, about a year ago, we found a kidney cell amongst all those blood cells. So we want to go and analyse that because they have a certain shape. Um, we could do eye colour. Um, yeah, the, the, there is, but really in, in anyone could bring a book out now and say, but the thing is, it would only ever be supposition. Again, you, you do need to match the blood. You've got to have blood and semen. You've got to have evidence. And thankfully, I have. Um, I can't see where it could go from here, really. Yeah. Now, that blood was tied to uh, a relative of Kuzminski, right? Uh, that's right. Uh, through yeah, That's absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. How was that? How did how did they take it? Um, well, they uh, the family of of Kuzminski, they all all obviously know um, who he was. Uh, you know, a suspect in the Ripper case. Um, I think one one of a bit of closure, really. You know, to say this is I, I met that uh, that person um, just after the story broke to to explain everything. You know, and yeah. Overwhelmed, I think that's the word I could really give you. Overwhelmed. Yeah, well, it, it yeah, <laughs> could it couldn't be a real thrilling thing to find out, but well, I, as as she did say to me, she certainly didn't do the murders. Yeah, no, of course, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's no, it's no light on her. It's just uh, absolutely, yeah. It must just feel, yeah, as you say, overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to take it all in. You know, it, it, one thing again, thinking or, or that he's just a suspect to actually be told it was him. Um, yeah, it's quite a big thing to take in, really. Oh, I bet. Well, this is certainly an interesting subject and your pleasure to talk to. Thank uh, you, Ian. Now, how can people get a hold of you if someone wants to um, uh, write you or, or, or um, get a hold of your book? Um, what's the best way to do it? Okay, well, um, you know, you can buy, I think the book's available on, online and Amazon, 
or in America it's with Barnes and Noble. Uh, with me personally, I've got my own Twitter, which is at Ripator LDN, or my website's um, www.thejacktheripperexperience.co.uk, and you can always link to me there. Okay. I recommend highly getting the book, reading it. A very, very good read. Um, and again, thank you very much for joining me. My and, pleasure. And uh, good luck in the future. Thank you very much, Alan. It's been a real, real honor. Thank you. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! How dare you? If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Wave Media.